What does it take to get good at surgery? Practice, repetitions. You just, same with anything else. You know, there's a million ways of people saying the same thing and selling books saying it, but do you call it 10,000 hours? Do you call it, you know, spend some chunk of your life, some percentage of your life focusing on this, obsessing about getting better at it? Um, repetitions, uh, humility, recognizing that you, you aren't perfect at any stage along the way, uh, recognizing you've got improvements to make in your technique, being open to feedback and coaching from people with a different perspective on how to do it. Um, and then uh, just the constant will to do better. Uh, that fortunately, you know, if you're not a sociopath, I think your patients bring that with them to the office visits every day. They, you know, force you to want to do better all the time. Yeah, just step up. I mean, it's a real human being, a real human being that you can help. Yeah. So every surgery, even if it's the same exact surgery, is there a lot of variability between that surgery and a different person? Yeah, a fair bit. I mean, a good example for us is that the angle of the skull relative to the normal plane of, of the body axis of the skull over hand knob uh, is pretty wide variation. I mean, some people have really flat skulls and some people have really steeply angled skulls over that area. And that has, you know, consequences for how their head can be fixed in, in, uh, in sort of the frame that we use um, and how the robot has to approach the skull. And um, yeah, people's, people's bodies are built as differently as, you know, the people you see walking down the street, as, as much variability in body shape and size as you see there. We see in brain anatomy and skull anatomy, um, there are some people who we've had to kind of exclude from our trial for having skulls that are too thick or too thin or scalp that's too thick or too thin. Um, I think, you know, we have like the middle 97% or so uh, of people, but <laughs> you can't account for all human anatomy variability. How much like mushiness and messes there. Cause I, uh, you know, taking biology classes, the diagrams are always really clean and crisp. Neuroscience, the pictures of neurons are always really nice and very. Yeah. Um, but whenever I look at pictures of like real brains, they're all, I, I don't know what is going on. Yeah. Uh, so how much are biological systems in reality, like how hard is it to figure out what's going on? Not too bad. Uh, once you really get used to this, you know, that's where experience and, and skill and uh, education really come into play is if you stare at a thousand brains, it becomes easier to kind of mentally peel back the, say, for instance, blood vessels that are obscuring the sulci and gyri, you know, kind of the wrinkle pattern of the surface of the brain. Occasionally, when you're when you're first starting to do this, and you open the skull, it doesn't match what you thought you were going to see based on the MRI. Uh, and with more experience, you you learn to kind of peel back that layer of blood vessels and see the underlying pattern of wrinkles in the brain, and uh, use that as a landmark for where you are. The wrinkles are a landmark. So, like, yeah. So I was describing hand knob earlier. That's a pattern of the wrinkles in the brain. It's sort of this sort of Greek letter omega shaped mm -hmm. area of the brain. So you could recognize the hand knob area. Like if, if I show you a thousand brains and give you like one minute with each, you'd be like, yep, that's that. Sure. And so there is some uniqueness to that area of the brain, like in terms of the geometry, the topology of the thing. Yeah. Where, where is it about in the... It's so you have this strip of brain running down the top yep. uh, called the primary motor area. And I'm sure you've seen this picture of the homunculus laid over the surface of the brain, the weird little guy with huge lips and giant hands. Uh, that guy sort of lays with his legs uh, up at the top of the brain and, and face arm uh, areas farther down and, and then some kind of mouth, lip, tongue areas uh, farther down. And so the hand is right in there. And then 
the areas that control speech, at least on the on the left side of the brain, in most people are are just below that. And so uh, any muscle that you voluntarily move in your body, um, the vast majority of that references that strip or those intentions come from that strip of brain and the the wrinkle uh, for hand knob is right in the middle of that. And vision is back back. here. Yep. Also on close to the surface. Vision's a little deeper. Uh, And so, you know, this gets to your question about how deep can you get. Um, To do vision, we can't just do the surface of the brain. We have to be able to go in uh, not not as deep as we'd have to go for DBS, but maybe a centimeter deeper than we're used to for hand insertions. Uh, and so that's, you know, work in progress. That's uh, a new set of challenges to overcome. By the way, you mentioned uh, the Utah array, and I just saw a picture of that, and that thing looks terrifying. Yeah, because it's, nails. <laughs> it's Because it's rigid, and then if you look at the threads, they're flexible. 